Conesty, how are you? Welcome back to the Candle Tales podcast, where we tell Irish stories and chat about them afterwards. My name is Aaron, and I'm in Ontario. We're in Canada, a slightly noisier area than where we usually record these intros. We're in Canada telling this story, and we decided to release it on this day that celebrates Irishness across the globe, where everyone knows St. Patrick, but do they know the great hero, Oisin, from the Fianna, who he gets talking to? Well, after this story, you know all about him. And we're telling this story on Kitchener tonight, and we just told it in Niagara, in Ontario, and it's just very exciting to be sharing these stories with the Irish diaspora in North America. And many of our Patreon supporters are from North America as well, so thank you so much for going to patreon.com forward slash candle tales and helping us out and inviting us to this locale. It's been an amazing experience, the first time across the pond, as they say, and we'll be back for sure. But in the meantime, sit back, Relax, enjoy this story, like, subscribe, share it if you care to, and most of all, enjoy this story, and happy Patrick's Day. You. In the winter of his life, Patrick felt that he had done good works, as good as any mortal man can do, with the help of God and the blessings he'd been given. Another man might have felt proud, but pride was a sin, and so Patrick was only quietly satisfied that his life's work had wrought such a great change in the country he now called his home. He had built a thriving community, a place where everyone was equal, and everyone worked together to make things as good as they could a community of brothers and sisters on earth as it was in heaven and all of them looking out for each other all of them taking care of each other all of them working and all of them praying singing together at matins and at noon and at evensong. A life of quiet prayer and contemplation. Not the most exciting life, perhaps. Not as exciting as his life had been in his own youth, but a good life, a holy life, a worthwhile life. He was accounted the wisest man in the whole land. He was often consulted on matters of politics and law. This was the custom of the people around him, but Patrick did what he could to withhold judgment. Not for him the affairs of the earthly and the worldly. He wanted to keep his own focus on the next world, the true life. But it was the way of these people to come and consult those they considered wise. And because he had shown the error of the ways of their druids, it was to him they now came when strange things happened. On one particular day, a strange thing indeed was presented to Patrick. An old, old man was brought before him. Now, there was nothing so terribly unusual in an old, old man, although this old man was very tall and very broad, and even though his muscles were withered with great age, they were still huge. He was in incredible physical condition. For all that his skin was wrinkled and his hair was white, and his eyes so dimmed with time that he was blind. What was extraordinary about this man was the story that came with him. The people said that he'd come riding across the waves on a white horse, and he'd been young, young and tall and beautiful, but he'd fallen from the horse and become old in a second. They all thought it was some sort of a curse of the other world, And Patrick knew that they were superstitious, 
the people of Ireland, in spite of all his work. But the old man had nowhere to go. He was blind. He was without clan or family to protect him. And so Patrick took him in to his own loving community. He told the old man the rules, that he would have to work for his keep, but he would be fed and taken care of and looked after properly. He began to regret his generosity almost immediately. The old man never seemed to stop complaining. He complained constantly. He didn't like the bells. He didn't like the sounds of the singing at prayer. He didn't like at all the fact that he was being made to work. Although Patrick could see by the strength that was still in his frame that he was no stranger to physical labor. But no, this old man complained bitterly. This work was beneath him, he said. He should be sitting in ease and comfort and attended to by others. No matter how many times Patrick told him that this was not the way things were done in his community, that worldly rank and station had no meaning to them here, still the old man complained about Patrick's poor hospitality. Now it was perhaps because of this that the other people in Patrick's community took a dislike to the old fellow and Patrick had to admit they could be cruel. One man threw water in his face, told him it was raining. They thought it was funny to lead him around in circles till he was lost and dizzied. There was one boy who absolutely idolised the old man. The old man used to put the lad up on his shoulders and the lad would tell him which way to go. And Patrick thought that was a good friendship, a good companionship for the two of them. Because the little boy loved the old man's mad stories of times gone by. And the old man needed the child, needed someone who thought he was a great hero. Whatever great and wonderful thing that he thought he was. But still, the old man's complaints went on. Complaints about the cold. Complaints about the singing. Complaints about the bells. Complaints about Patrick. Very personal complaints about Patrick. And how his community was run. His wonderful, loving community built on the work of all the people there who dedicated their lives to prayer and to God. And Patrick found his patience wearing thinner by the day. The old man's favourite thing to complain about was the food. He did not get enough of it. And so Patrick gave him more and more and more until he was giving him a truly outrageous amount of food. The meat of an entire cow every day, enough to feed the rest of the community for a week if they ate nothing but it. An entire skillet of bread all to himself. A whole churn of butter just for this one old man. And still, he called Patrick miserly. And when Patrick pointed out to him the extreme largesse with which he was being treated, the old man came out with one of his wild stories. He said, I've seen blackbirds bigger than your cows. I've seen rowan berries bigger than your churns of butter. I've seen ivy leaves bigger than your skillets of bread. And Patrick was so tired of this old man and his exaggerations and his complaints and his insults that he finally snapped and said, No, you haven't. You are old. You might not be sane anymore, but you are old. And you are lying. 
Now the old man was deeply offended. He was shook to his core to be accused of lying. Strength of limb, purity of heart, and actions to match his words was how he was always brought up to be and behave and never had lying ever even crossed his mind. Well, he took deep breath and scowled at Patrick. He asked for a chance to prove his word. I'll show you I am no liar, Paddy. Nor am I insane. I am Ocean of the Fear. My word is my bond. And I can prove to you that what I say is true. Oshin looked up. He saw the young friend looking over at him aghast to see him accused by Patrick of being a liar. He called his young friend to him and asked him for his help. He was, after all, the only one amongst these new pound people that he could trust. And so he gave him a task to go and collect pups newly born from a bitch that had given birth the day before. To tack a hide of an animal killed that morning to the wall where the blood was still wet. Then from a distance of five meters to throw those pups at the wall. Whichever one stuck and clung on was the dog Oshin wanted this boy to bring him back. The young boy was eager and excited and ran off to do his bidding. When he came back with a small pup, with a small bit of blood around his feet, Oshin grinned and thought this indeed was a very good hound and all the makings of a fierce one. He told the boy to raise this pup in darkness and not to give him a scent or a lick of blood. This was crucial because as soon as he was old enough and big enough and strong enough, they would bring him the Glen Smuel, the valley where a great rock held a treasure underneath it to prove Oshin's word. They would dig up these artifacts, an iron ball, a huge old sword and a horn that once blown upon, magic birds would appear. Oshin thought back to the great hounds of his father Bran and Skiolan, the great and many ferocious hounds that would join them in the hunt, the many beasts they conquered all over Ireland, and the agility and strength of all of the Fianna as they used to run through the forests. He told Patrick of the tests to get into the Fianna, you see, like his new religion, he thought, anyone could come and join the Fianna, but only the best could pass the tests. The great tests were starting off with a simple chase to the forest. You would be let off and running, with the Fianna chasing a few moments afterwards, watching to see if any twig was displaced on the ground or any bird would fly from the trees. If either of those happened, the test was failed. But second to that, the Fianna would chase fast behind, running down this, this young sprite who thought themselves so able-bodied. Well, whether it was a girl or a boy, they would be ran down and chased. If caught, they might not survive it, depending on which hero of the Fianna found them. Patrick seemed unimpressed. Yet, Oshin was away with his memory now, remembering the second trial to join the Fianna. Well, you would be placed in a hole, high enough as your neck with an arm's reach right around you as the Fianna would stand 100 meters back. You would be given a stick. That alone to protect you as the Fianna from their distance would hurl swords and spears at you. 
Considering you were underneath the ground, you could duck a lot of the time, so Oshie thought it was oftentimes the easier. But you couldn't defend yourself very well, and yet if you had a scrape on you, you would not be allowed in the field. And the final test he remembered with such glee was the jumping and spinning test. You would be let run as fast as you could, as fast as the wind was preferable, and a pole as high as your neck would be in front of you. You would leap above this, spinning around to pull a thorn out of your heel while then landing down, ducking below a pole held as low as your knees without slowing down. You'd have to come to a perfect halt in front of the Fianna, who then would give the last test in accordance to Fionn McCool, Oshin's father, who told him quite specifically that any man or woman who would join the Fianna and Ban Fianna would have to be able to regale the great stories of old, the seven volumes of old stories, histories and mythologies to such a great extent that they could bring a grown man to tears with their retelling. It was not until this great new hero could pass and prove this test they would be allowed into the Fianna. And then they would spend all of their summers across Ireland, Munster in the south of the flatlands, the high ragged hills in the north of Ulster, the stony fields and wet washed wind across Connacht, and in Leinster the bountiful and brilliant halls of the kings. They would avoid they would spend most of the summers in the forests, collecting and hunting game and training for any invasion or battle they may come up against. Of course, in the winter times, that was when they got to tell their stories. They would be housed in those great halls by the kings and women kings of Ireland, regaling them of all of the summer conquests, battles and nights they spent sleeping under the stars. Oshin was lost in his memory, and the sadness of not having the Fianna next to him was avoided while he was telling it, but it came back to him as soon as he looked at Patrick and remembered the strange time that he was now in, all because of his time in Tirnanog. And Patrick told the old man his story. How he had grown up, the son of a nobleman, coddled and cosseted, and never knowing any dis-ease or discomfort. Brought up by parents who believed in the true God, but he never gave that part of his life much thought. Not then. But raiders had come to his home and stolen young Patrick away and brought him to Ireland as a slave. And so his life had changed utterly, overnight, from one of ease to one of terror and hardship. He was brought to Ireland and he was put to work. And this island that he came to was very different to the one that Oshin described. It was not a land where a high king ruled and a Fianna patrolled the boundaries. It was a land gone savage and turned in on itself. For all the holes to the other world that the Fianna had once patrolled, they were still wide open. There were creatures crawling through paste and olifaste and all kinds of things. There was no Fianna to defend the people. Only little warlords, little kings on little hills, 
all of them with their own little armies and all of them fighting amongst themselves incessantly. There was no peace and without peace there was no prosperity. And so the people raided one another and then raided farther and farther afield, stealing livestock, stealing people. And Patrick was one of them. The work that he was given to do was the work of a shepherd on the hillside. And it was lonely work for a boy like Patrick. He spent his days, not unpleasantly, aside from the gnawing hunger that was his constant companion. But his nights, his nights were a time of torment. Alone in the darkness, with nothing and no one to protect him. In a land full of monsters. Wolves were the least of his worries. But as time went on, Patrick realised something. He realised that somewhere inside him, somewhere in his heart, there was a part of him that was not afraid. It was very small, a little spark. A little spark in him that was not frightened. And when he was frightened and alone at night, he would look at that little spark inside him that was not afraid. And it was like blowing in the embers of a fire. The more he held on to it, the more he looked at it, the brighter it got and the stronger. And the more he looked at that spot, the more he realised that that part of him was not afraid and it was not lonely. It was not hungry. It was not diminished. It was nothing on earth, he realised, could touch that spark. Because that spark was his connection to his God. And when Patrick came to know that, to know God and to know himself. The cold on the hillside bothered him less and less. And though the teeth of winter were just as harsh, and though the monsters that sometimes roared their way out of the other world were just as terrifying, he always kept his eye on that part of him. He was not cold, he was not afraid. One day a woman came to him as he was sitting by his campfire thinking about nothing in particular. She came striding out of the mists with a cloak around her shoulders and her hair loose and flowing round her face. And when he looked at her he could not tell if she was young or old. She smiled a kind smile at him and she said I heard you calling. Patrick was confused. He said, I didn't call. No, I heard you, Patrick. And it's a different call you have on you than anyone else I've ever met. And I'd sit a while now with you and talk to you about it. And so she sat down by the fire and they talked long into the night. And she told him she told him of her fears for her land, how it had fallen and fragmented, how there was nothing to bring everyone together again. They were all pursuing their own stories, their own interests. None of them cared for one another, not outside their own little tribes. And as long as that situation went on, there would never be peace. There would never be prosperity. And Patrick, Patrick found himself telling her about that thing he'd found, that part of him that wasn't frightened, that couldn't be touched and couldn't be hurt. And he spoke about it and he spoke about the stories he'd heard in his childhood, stories of God and stories of Jesus and how it all fitted together for him, the spark and the God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
And she watched him with the firelight flickering in her eyes. And she smiled and she said, I think that's what we need. I think that's just what we need. And she told him that her name was Sheila. And it wasn't until years later, when he was thinking back on that conversation, that Patrick realised he'd never given her his name. But she'd known it all the same. He fell asleep by the fire that night, across from Sheila. And he was not sure at what time in their conversation he drifted into dreams. Because when he woke, it was to her voice, whispering urgently in his ear. Get up, she said. Get up, Patrick, get up and go now, go to the coast. Get into that water and swim. Swim straight out and don't look back and don't stop. Go now. And he got up. And he trusted her and he trusted God and he ran straight to the coast and he dove into the waves, dark and thrashing though they were. And he put his back to the shore and he swam straight out. And he met a ship. A ship of his own country, with his own people on it. People speaking a language he had not heard in years. And when they pulled him from the waves, he rejoiced. And they brought him home. Right back to his own family, who thought him dead. And the celebrations were full of joy, but Patrick knew that he was not going to stay. He knew that he had fallen in love on that cold hillside and that he had a vocation now. And so he told his family that he was going to Rome and he was going to study, to learn everything he could about God so that he'd go back to Ireland and bring that story to its people. And that's just what he did. He studied long and he worked hard. And when he was ordained, he returned. Not as a slave this time, but as a missionary. And who did he see when he stepped off the ship? But Sheila, as if she'd been expecting him smiling at him from the crowd. Patrick and Sheila were married and the two of them set out on a quest to close down every single one of the holes to the other world. All of those passages where the creatures were creeping through. The old man was sullen as Patrick told him of his youth and childhood. And Patrick remembered who he was talking to. This was a man of the old tradition, who valued actions more than words. And Patrick sat back and thought, cast his mind back to his youth. When he'd slain a dragon or two in his time, He sat forward and told the old man a new tale. Patrick and Sheila spent their time going about this land, stopping up all the gaps, all the passages between this world and the other world through which the creatures came to terrorise the Irish. She knew the places. She knew where they slipped through. She knew the spots of danger, the waterways and the wild places, those passages to the other world, to Underhill, to the land of the Shi. And they stopped them up, the two of them together. And she used prayers of herbs and salt, and he used prayers of wine and wafer. And their ways were strange to one another, but their goal was the same. And they worked together as a team. And when the work was done, 
and every passageway that she knew of had been stopped. The two of them went west, to a mountain called the Reek, that had been sacred to the god of the sun in times gone by. And Patrick climbed to the top, and Sheila climbed with him, both of them barefoot. And when they clambered to the top of that place, they began a final great spell, a great prayer of cleansing to sweep all of the demons, all of the creatures of the other world that were already through those stopped up passageways, to sweep them all up in a whirlwind and cast them out to sea to ensure that everyone in Ireland would be safe from their harm. And that whirlwind blew across the land, sweeping up the creatures before it, carrying them up to the top of the reek and casting them out and out and out over the waves till they were far enough away they could do no harm to anyone. But there was one. One that slipped through their spells and their prayers. And her name was the Kertana. The Kertonok had been born when the world was just a mass of fire. And she had nestled at the heart of the earth, waiting and brooding for centuries. She was the mother of all demons, the mother of the devil himself. And she and her brood waited until humanity emerged on the earth. And then, they had something to prey on. And so then they came forth and began their wicked work. And she was too old and too strong for Patrick's prayers. And she slipped out of his whirlwind and she landed on the reek in front of him. He staggered back and she snarled into his face. But he held up his cross and his crozier and he drove her back and she turned and she fled from Patrick. He called out then. He called out for a steed. He could not follow her on foot. And by his side, as if in answer to his prayer, was a white horse, the fastest in the land. He leapt on its back and he rode pell-mell after the Kerthonok. All across Ireland they raced. She went before him spitting in wells and streams and rivers so that there was nowhere for Patrick to slake his thirst, which grew and grew as he went, until it was a torment to him. But he prayed, and at his prayer his horse stumbled, and Patrick fell from its back and struck his shoulder on a rock, and the rock split, and clean, cold water bubbled out, and he was able to slake his thirst. But the Kertonok, on her wild ride, flew on ahead of him. And as she went spitting poison and venom into all the waterways, she heard a sound. She heard a musician at a crossroads, wrapped in his art, lost in his music that he was making. And she opened her jaws and she swallowed the musician whole. And so lost was he in the music he was making that he kept playing from inside of her belly. The Kertonok was going to Loch Derg, for her lair was at the bottom of the lake. And Patrick knew, and she knew as well, that if she got there, if she got to her place of power, he would be hard pressed to wrest her out of this land. She would be able to stay there poisoning it with her evil forever. But he followed. He caught up to her at the shores of the lake on his white horse and he leapt off. And although he was not a warrior, he faced the demon with prayers on his lips. And the two of them there fought. They wrestled together. And Patrick, the holy man, he cast the demon down. And she opened her mouth and she vomited up the musician onto the beach who wandered off, playing all the while.
But as Patrick cast the demon down, and as the Kertonok fell down into hell, she had one last trick up her sleeve, and she twisted as she fell, and she revealed it to him. She showed it to Patrick, the fires of hell, the place where all the wicked and unshriven go, the place of her kind, reigning supreme. And in this vision, Patrick knew fear. For the first time since he was a boy, for the first time since he'd heard that still small voice inside, on that cold hillside, because this was a place of spiritual pain. This was a place where even that place inside him that could not be touched by anything on earth could be burned. And that terrified him. And so when he rejoined Sheila, back at the Reek, he told her there was a new mission now. They must convert the people. Of course they had been sharing their stories as they went about their travels and their works, and some people had been inclined to listen and some had not. But now there was a new fervour that gripped Patrick. He had to save these people, not just from demons in this world, but from the next world as well. And Sheila looked at him with a coldness in her eyes and she said, that is not what we agreed to. But Patrick was determined. He went about with missionary zeal. And some time later he realised she was by his side less and less, his wife, Sheila, until the day came when she was not there at all. And he looked to Oshin now, this proud old man, and beseeched him. Oshin, I have seen the fires of hell with my own eyes. I know the torment that awaits the godless in the next life. Convert, Oshin. Come over into the light of God. It is too late for the many poor pagan souls of this country from before my time. But it is not too late for you. Oshin looked at St. Patrick, nearly growling at him. Hell, he thought. He'd heard rumours of hell, the fire, the demons. He shook his head to think of all those dead. So many years, so many friends, his own father and all of the heroes of the Fianna. In hell, he thought. Well, he thought of Oscar, the greatest warrior of all of Athena, his own son, the Battle of Gabra. Cabra, the son of Art, the son of Khan of a hundred battles, had been the High King for quite a while. An animosity and hatred between him and the Fina grew, till one day it all led to where they knew it would go to. A great battle, the Battle of Gabra, where many of the Fenians, many of the heroes, many of the great warriors lost their lives. Cabra was killed by Oscar, but Oscar, the fierce lion-like warrior, died in that fight. And so Oshin thought that if his son had died while fighting an unjust king, surely he'd be rewarded if there was any afterlife after the stories you tell from one so great as Oscar of the Fianna. He couldn't quite get his head around this afterlife after all. There was so much reward and beauty and magic in this life, this one precious life that he lived. He couldn't imagine anything better than Tiernan Og, really. But his father, 
Fionn McCool had always had a broken heart, he thought. And for all of the pain he now felt when he thought of his son and the others, Dermot with the Bull Shirka, Gull McMorna, Conan Whale, even him, he thought, he would not see ever again. But his father, Fionn, had held on to a heartbreak that he could never really understand. O'Sheen told Patrick that his mother was a dear woman. She was, after all, cursed by an evil druid and changed into the shape of a deer and brought off to the other world. The Lady Saive, O'Sheen remembered. The beautiful woman he only had faint feelings and bare emotions of memories that wafted by his conscious mind as if mist dispersed over the early morning dew, revealing scant and bare memories for him to dwell upon. He could not recall or remember his mother's face, but he did remember the feeling of holding on to a deer before she was dragged away. Oshin had grown up with the Fianna, his father training him. They had found him on the side of a hill, Ben Bulbin, he believed it was, clinging on to a hawthorn tree when the Fianna were out hunting. And in seeing them hunt and seeing them display such a brilliant way about them for everything they did, Oshin was delighted to follow in his father's footsteps and train and regale all the stories of once upon a different time. But he always knew the sadness was in his father. He had always gone out hunting in search for something more than he was letting on. Any time Bran and Skjolan's ears spiked up for the scent and sound of a deer running through the forest, he would run into the clearing and hope for a moment to see or sense a creature that was not just a deer, but his dear Saif. Fionn never mentioned her name. He never talked about his heartbreak. He never not once admitted his own hurt. But it hung like that, over them, over the Fianna, over his relationship with his own father, to have a broken heart mixed in between them. Well, Fionn never really fell in love with any other woman after that, although there was others. Oshin had never really fully fallen for anyone either. Not until Niamh, he thought. And when she came to the forests where they were hunting to try and find him and him alone out of all of the Fianna, Oshin stared at her shock of blonde hair and knew she was of the other world. Niamh Kinor. Niamh of the curling hair, Niamh of the uttermost beauty and brilliance and love. A love that Oshin had not felt, a love that he had longed for, a love that he had heard stories of. A love that he knew his father felt when he had been with the Lady Saive for all to a brief a time. And so when Oshin saw Niamh Kinor offer him a life in Tirnanog, full of love and possibilities, endless adventures, he <laughs> could not refuse it, and leapt upon the back of the horse, eager and willing and waiting to explore. His father's scowl, a surprise to him. 
Fionn shaking his head, knowing the perils of the other world, and asked Oshin not to go, eventually putting a guess upon him that he would have to return back to Ireland, to his people. Oshin accepted, knowing once a guess is put on you, he would have to always follow through, but not thinking then of the time that would pass. And after he rode over the waves with Niamh Kinor to a land far, far away, he filled his mind, his vision, his everything with the wonders of the other world. <laughs> oh, she looked at Patrick, now a man so stuck, he thought, in a belief, in a believing of a time after this, when all Oshin had was this moment, every single moment so filled, full of beauty and happiness, a sense of everything that he could have ever wanted in every moment, in the land of the eternal youth and the ever happy the feasts and the songs, the singing, the dancing, the land where no one ever was sad or sick. But that trick, the Gesh, always calling him back to Ireland. Even though he had two beautiful children, his son he named Oscar after the great hero he had left behind in Ireland. His daughter, Blanad. He had hoped to see them grow to their full and true beauty. But he knew he would have to go. And in a span of not so many years, he could not recall because the time moved so strangely in the other world. He didn't think he'd been gone that long. But then a day in Ternano could be ten years over here. Time flies when you're having fun, he thought. Everything about the land changed when he came back. The air was different. The sense of self was changed because you cannot remain the same in a time that is not your own. And Oshin walked through the land on horseback, looking at the grey and the sick and the weak and the weary, until eventually he came to three men building a road. Oh, so weak were they. And Neva told him not to dismount, but helping them pick up a rock. The strap on the horse broke and he fell to the road and the rocks and the earth of Ireland and he synced up his time with this land and a thousand years of aging fell onto him in a moment and now all he could do was remember the great heroes of a different time of a time gone long long before he could now only imagine where and how Niamh Kinor and Blanad, his daughter, and Oscar, his son, now were in the land of the eternal youth. Could they see through the veil? Could they sense or see or seem to know that he would not be able to come back to them? He wondered at all this and looked at Patrick thinking of a God outside of now, outside of this harmony, outside of the moment they were living, and couldn't comprehend it. Perhaps Fionn should have talked to you about it, about the Lady Sive. Perhaps then you wouldn't be so heartbroken. After all, penance and confession are how we overcome our hurts. Oshin was furious at Patrick for attempting to understand him 
After all, Fionn had done so much. Talking about his feelings surely wouldn't have helped. He growled at him then. Fionn killed the king of the world. I don't see you or your saints killing kings. Stop looking for God right in front of you. God is under every rock. So stop looking at the rock, Oshin. Patrick suddenly reminded Oshin, under every rock. Now as these months had lingered, and long talk went into the night, Oshin was now reminded of the dog, the hound that was being trained in darkness with no scent or taste of meat. They would now prove Oshin was no liar. What he spoke was the truth. He'd indeed seen blackbirds bigger than Patrick's cows, berries huger than his churns of butter, and ivy leaves bigger than any skillet of bread he'd seen in this pitiful time. Oshin called the boy. The serving boy came to him with the dog in hand. A strong beast, not as strong as Bran or Skjolan, Oshin thought. But it was time to go. They left then and they went to the great valley Glen Smoil, where the old man dug under a rock. The rock. Neatly off to the corner on one side, he recognised it, you see. The boy drew back, watching the old man bent, double and burrow underneath this rock until he came up holding a great metal ball in one hand, a huge sword in the other. And then between his feet on the ground lay a great horn. He called to the boy and told him to give three great bellows through the horn. The boy picked up the horn and went to blow it. Pitifully, it did not make any sound. A second and then a third time the boy tried to blow through the horn but failed to muster the sound that it should have made. Oshin dropped the metal ball and the sword and grabbed this great horn. He grabbed it and put it between his lips and with a great big bellow the sound that filled the surrounding valley and fields and island of Ireland itself was cacophonous. Suddenly, the boy saw the dog jerk and twitch and snarl. A flock of great birds flew overhead. So huge were these birds, the boy could not believe the beating of their wings. Such a long span. The talons, the beaks, the beady eyes. In a second, a huge, great flock of birds flew from the horizon over their head, this time higher up in the sky, and this time must be twice as big. And finally, a third, great, big flock of birds, giant they were, flew over their head, so massive they were that he could not believe it. Now, however fierce and snarling and angry the dog looked at the first flock of birds, the second made it more angry and by the third this dog was choking back his barks, his angry, vicious calls, blood was in his eyes. And Oshin told the boy to let him off. The dog ran around on the ground, not able to do anything with those birds so far above. Then Oshin asked the boy to point him towards where those birds in the sky were. And he held the iron ball in his hand. He put it into his sling swung it over his shoulder, over his head, grounding his feet down and moving his arms in such a fluid motion that he cast the iron ball straight through the air and it hit the bird and it landed on the ground and the dog snarled and went snapping straight.
straight for it. The bird rose up and with huge talons, spread its wings and cawed and clawed at the dog, who went snarling and snapping his way through the bird's neck. A ferocious fight it was between a hound and great giant bird, but once Oshin heard the dying squawks, he knew the dog had won. But suddenly the dog turned around ravenous now from the taste of blood on its mouth for the very first time in its entire life. The dog went blood crazy and went running towards the boy and Oshin. Oshin heard it coming and told the boy sadly to hand him his sword. He heard the dog running towards him and with one great swing he cut the dog in two. Oshin then instructed the boy to gather the bird, put it on a trolley and try to bring it all the way down so that Patrick could see this giant black bird. After all, Oshin knew these birds ate particular berries of a particular tree that was now quietly not being digested inside the belly of the bird. He looked forward to seeing Patrick's face when he saw the size of it. Ah, buddy, there you are. What's this I have here? My God, it, it appears to be a, a blackbird. And how big does it appear to be? Approximately the size of... of a cow. Indeed. And in its beak. An ivy leaf. Larger in size than a skillet of bread. And a berry in its belly. Yes, Oshin. Larger than a churn of butter. That's right, Paddy. And what of your accusations of my lying? In the face of this rather extraordinary evidence, I must admit myself to have been a mistake. Patrick had to admit, all of Oshin's wild stories were true. And so he ordered his monks to write them all down, these tales of the Fianna because he knew they were as true as his Gospels, and they deserved to be preserved. For all the paganism that could not help but slip in when they were written down by men of faith. But after his great exertion, and after killing his hound, some light seemed to have gone out in Oshin. He was as stubborn as ever, but he was tired, more easily now, spent more of his days in bed, and it was not now the laziness that Patrick had seen in him. It was his age, his great and terrible age finally catching up to him, laying low this warrior poet. Patrick tried one last time to make Oshin see the light, but the stubborn old pagan just turned his face to the wall and would not listen. And Patrick sat with him as his breathing became shallow and then began to rattle and rasp in his throat. And he bent his head and he wept that so great a soul should condemn himself to hell for the sake of his own pride. And Patrick was there when Oshin last of the Fianna, took his last breath and died. In hell, some say, the Fianna lay in torment. After the Battle of Gavra, when half of their number was slain, and no one was there to maintain the greatness of the Fianna, more and more and more of them went 
all the way, dragged down the terrible lake of fire in the pits of hell, tormented by demons and creatures of the other world. Until there were enough of them, and then they decided it was time to break free. Oscar pulled his chains off the wall. Such a fierce and brilliant pull, it took great rocks with it. These unbreakable chains that could not be broken were swung over his head as he clubbed down great demons from the hellfire. Oscar at the back, watching and waiting for any demon to attack. He let the rest of the Fena run on ahead as he stayed beating demons aside with his chains. And out from the hell fire, the Fena came. And now some of us know the Fena carved a passage out of hell. And we take solace in this. For anyone who finds themselves going through hell, there is a way out. If you follow the footfall of the Fianna, their strength will be on your limbs, their purity will be on your heart, and with true words on your lips, you will walk out of any hell, leaving ashes and flames behind you.